Okay, we are live again. We are going to try this. Everyone who is with us, we are so sorry. We don't know. It's opposition in all things. We're trying to do section 109. But we are here. And thank you for joining us again. We are here in, in Kirtland, Ohio. We you have the, the visitor center in our background. We're going to try. We don't know if this internet is going to work for us. So we are going to try just quickly, see what happens. Our hope is to be able to pass the temple, stop at the stop at the cemetery, get to the Joseph and Emma Smith house and have a discussion there about section 109 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Because as you know, Joseph Smith and Emma Smith were there in this home as they were watching this incredible Kirtland Temple be built. And, and I just want to say last night, and thank you again for joining us. We see all these wonderful faces. Hello, Oregon and Toronto and California. We, we, we are trying to be as obedient as we can and not um, be in front of the temple. We're, not, we're trying to be as obedient as we can as far as taking pictures and being here with you in Kirtland. Is that right, Elaine? It, it really is, but we have to just tell you about last night in the temple. Yes. With DNC in our bones now, uh, Barbara was able to speak to uh, a group of, of missionaries. And Elaine. And I got the privilege to do that as well. And to stand in that room at that pulpit where where Joseph Smith saw God the Father and Jesus Christ and where Moses, Elias and Elijah appeared and to read Doctrine and Covenants 110 was the most powerful experience. I, I've been here before but I haven't felt what I felt this time. Do you agree Barb? I, I was absolutely humbled and filled with, I, I would say, maybe the word is endowed with power. Yeah, these are these are uh, these are no ordinary times, uh, and I I can't tell you how grateful we started in the sacred grove, and the the awareness of what we have in this church with the gospel, restored gospel of Jesus Christ has just hit me harder than ever before. The grateful feeling I had about Joseph Smith going into that grove of trees. Everything has just been amplified for me, oh. I think, Barb. A hundred percent. I mean, we were in the Sacred Grove and we had a discussion about understanding God the Father and Jesus Christ and the adversary and, and identity. So we talked about identity of Joseph and, and God and the Savior. Identity of Lucy, Max Smith. We talked about the identity of Emma Smith. We talked about the identity of of Mary Whitmer and the family there and the identity of women. We talked about, uh, as we were leaving that farm, we, we climbed the hill Camorra, we talked about Moroni and the strength that he had and the faith that he had in bearing those plates. Yeah. And um, and then Joseph finding them and being guided by the Lord to have that right, just the right family at the, at, at the right place at the right time. We left there, we went to the Whitmer farm and just had a powerful experience learning of, again, and reminding us of the restoration of the church and just six people, but so many, six men that were there, but so many women and the influence of these women and covenant keeping women and the influence that they've had on these families. And we've been in their homes and those beautiful homes and, and how well kept and beautiful they were and how you could see how they cooked. You could see how they heated food. You could see how they cleaned. And I, I just, I stand all amazed. Barb has just gone uh, for a minute because we have to be so careful here. The, of course the temple is a sacred place and so we have to be careful what we can show and what we can't show. And we want to be so respectful of that and honor that. We, we just wish that each one of you could be here with us. And as we talk about Doctrine and Covenants 109 and what happened uh, in that temple as it was dedicated, just pause and think. If any of you had ancestors here, it was an outpouring of the spirit like never before. I know my husband had an ancestor who was not couldn't even get in the temple, and uh, couldn't even couldn't even get in. But she testified that there were angels on the roof of that temple, and the lights were shining. And so, as we think about the atmosphere that DNC 109 was given, uh, it's really divine. It is. Now we're going to do something. We're going to change phones or something here. We're going to keep that phone, but we're actually going to oh. have a holder so we don't oh, hold it for a whole hour. Thank you, Dustin. <laughs> You're the best. So 
I want to talk about something that that we talked about yesterday as well, if that's okay, Elaine. Yes, do. We were talking about Section 109, and you know, we've talked as a group already. We've talked a lot about the beginning parts of that section, and I want to just look at the end of Section 109. And in Section 109, at the very end, the Lord says this. We've actually talked through a oh, beautiful part of this, but. 69, he's talking about his prophets and his leaders and the presidents of the church. We get to verse 75. When the trump shall sound for the dead, we shall be caught up in the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with the Lord, that our garments may be pure, that we may be clothed upon with robes of righteousness, with palms in our hands and crowns of glory upon our heads and reap eternal joy for all of our sufferings. We think about this process of them moving from New York and the call to go in section 36, the saints are called by the Lord. They're, they're first of all told about the temple and then section 37, they're mentioned, you know, he mentions calling them to the Ohio and 38, they're being told to go to the Ohio. And we discussed why calling people to go to the Ohio. And in section 36, we see that he's trying to help them become unified. He's trying to protect them. He's trying to help them become one. And he also says in those sections that he is helping and establishing Zion and he's going to endow them with power from on high. We see this in section in section 110 and we see in section I mean sorry we see this in section 38. Right. And we continue right. on with the scriptures and we went from Ohio down to down to Harmony Pennsylvania. Right. And we went into the Emma Smith and Joseph Smith home. We went into this the sacred graveyard there where their infant son Alvin was was buried. We went to the, the gravesite of Alvin up in, in Fayette as well, but we went to this beautiful gravesite. We saw the home. We, we went to the Susquehanna River and we talked about President Nelson telling the women of the church that the restoration of the priesthood is just as important to the women of the church as it is to men. And how significant it actually is that this restoration of the priesthood, Peter, James, and John there in that, in that sugar bush and then Emma's use of section 25, the revelation of section 25 and how powerful that section is and how it leads us to the temple as he's helping us, helping her to prepare to not only enter the temple to be, but to be a temple person. So then we left that area. We had a fantastic time. We came across and we just discussed the priesthood power of women and we discussed what the priesthood is and we traveled across the entire bus, traveled to Ohio discussing priesthood and spiritual gifts and who we are as covenant women and the responsibility that we have to be leading the world as women in this in this church and then to come here to the john johnson farm and to learn more about emma and joseph and the death of these twins and the responsibility to to um what the lord would have us do is we are trying to become celestial people yeah. in section 76. yeah it, it it's quite remarkable and um I don't think they did it alone. Uh, I, I love in this section 109 that uh, they pray in verse 15, and that they may grow up in thee and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Think about receiving not just the Holy Ghost, but a fullness of the Holy Ghost within those walls. Barb, yeah. what does that mean to you? Well, be just before that, I think, you know, the Susquehanna River, President Nelson has asked us to have a have a to have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine of Christ, and I think it's found foundational that in the Susquehanna River they're asked to exercise their faith, they're asked to repent, they are performing then the ordinance of baptism, and they are receiving the ability because of the Aaronic priesthood to give the Holy Ghost, to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now they've sacrificed everything, they've left, they've proven themselves to the Lord, and they are now being given these keys. And what we were talking about last night in the temple is keys allow an individual, a priesthood holder who has these keys, to turn the key, to open the door. These keys rejoice in the keys, right? This is, right. This is President Nelson, rejoice these keys. So the key is turned in, in Harmony, Pennsylvania, for all women and men to enter into a happier, holier, and higher way of living because of the Aaronic priesthood. Now they come to later in, in, in harmony and they are receiving the Melchizedek priesthood. But when they come to this temple here in Kirtland, the keys of the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, the patriarchal order, those are now being revealed. 
And these are the keys that we speak of specifically in section 110. So they come, to, they come here to Kirtland, they prepare this incredible temple, the sacrifice of these women, the sacrifice of these men to build this temple. And I'm just gonna read this. I know we're talking section 109, but section 110. It's so, it so goes with, with this, and it's, it's what we kind of experienced last night. Yes. As we were in that beautiful temple. And, and I have to say, it is beautiful. It's been beautifully taken care of. And we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to now have it in our possession. But I feel such gratitude for the reorganized church. I do too. For the community they of have Christ. been such loving, loving stewards of a very sacred place. It, 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 sacred places are sacred to all of us. And you can feel this sacred place. Absolutely, Elaine. So, so in section 110 is where these keys are actually being revealed. And, and we see this in section 110. I find it fascinating at first that we, we see Christ. Yeah. So he says, and this is where we were standing at the pulpit last night. And it was the most amazing thing to just turn my, my left hand and just say, this is where Christ was. This isn't, it wasn't that Christ was somewhere else. He was right here. And he does walk beside us. But in this section 110, he was right here. And so then the veil was taken from our minds. This is section 110, verse 1. And the eyes of our understanding were opened. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastplate of the pulpit before us. And under his feet was paved work of pure gold in color like amber. His eyes were as a flaming fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was at the sound of the rushing great waters, even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am the first, first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, your sins are forgiven you, and you are clean before me. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Now, notice these words rejoice. President Nelson's talk is titled, Rejoice, rejoice in the, the Gift the, Rejoice in the Gift of Priesthood Keys. Rejoice yeah. in the Gift of Keys. Yeah. Notice this word rejoice in verse 5. And rejoice, verse 6. Let the, let the hearts of your brethren rejoice. Let the hearts of all my people rejoice. Who have with their might built this house to my name. This is Christ speaking to these people. Verse 7. For behold, I have accepted this house. My name shall be here. And I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. I will appear into my servants and speak unto them with mine own voice. Which he did. If my people will keep my commandments and do not pollute this holy house, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly re rejoice in the consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. And the fame of this house, which is a fame of this house, this house has become, this is, we have fulfilled this prophecy now. The house, the fame of the Kirtland Temple has become huge as President Nelson makes that announcement in, in April 2024. We have bought this temple, rejoice in the keys. Shall spread to foreign lands. And this is the beginning of the blessings which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people. Even so, amen. That's the end of the first vision that they receive in section 110. It's Jesus Christ himself introducing himself, accepting this house, accepting their sacrifice, and then telling them, I mean, they've come all the way to Kirtland They've spent all these years restoring this church, and he just tells them, this is the beginning of what I want you to do. They've yeah. left the Isaac, you know, we have the Isaac Morley farm, and they've sacrificed so much there. This is still the beginning of what, that would, of what the Lord is going to have them do. The keys have not yet been restored, but the Lord accepts the house, and now the keys are about ready to be restored. I know, and you know, it's, it's struck me several times about the order and the... Of, of the way the Lord has restored these, because of course the keys to the Uranic priesthood would be restored by John the Baptist. Uh, of, of, course, of course, yes. Of course the keys to the gathering of Israel would be restored by Moses. Yes. I mean, it just it just makes so much sense in when you read the Old Testament and when you understand your scriptures that this is the way it would work. Um, I just want to read 73 and 109, Barb, Please. because it says that thy church may come forth out of the wilderness of darkness and shine forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, and be adorned as a bride for that day when thou shalt unveil the heavens and cause the mountains to flow down at thy presence and the valleys to be exalted, the rough places made smooth, that thy glory may fill the earth. I, I felt that glory. 
I felt that glory in everywhere we've been. Absolutely. I felt that glory last night. Uh, we are engaged in a great work. And I think it is such a privilege to be women and men on the earth at this time. This is a, a, an amazing time to be alive. Don't oh, agree, Elaine, Barb? it is incredible. So last night, I mean, yes, we're just looking at, and I love the next verse where it talks about it. I'm oh, just going to turn it over. Turn it over. I, we realized yesterday, Elaine and I had a very funny moment. When we were opening the scriptures, we were going to we were going to discuss section 109 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and all of a sudden it occurred to both of us that my section 109, if you see it, this this is a little bit embarrassing, but it's, it's missing gone. section 109. I I have I have the introduction to section 109, and then I jump to verse 66 because I've been we've been studying it and talking about it so much and thinking about it so much. My section 109, I'm pretty sure, is on my desk at home. So we're on this whole trip. I keep trying to go to my, my phone, but last night we just realized there is no section 109 in my scriptures at this moment because we've been studying and talking about it so much and following the prophet and learning so much that it has fallen out of my scriptures. But I'm sure we'll find it. Right, Elaine? Isn't it wonderful, though? I, she said, you're not going to believe this, but my section 109 is gone. <laughs> I said, that sounds like losing like the, the I know, this is like Martin Harris yeah. losing the... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but I okay. So I'll go on from here, Elaine. If that's okay, okay, please do. Although I love, you know, you just talked about this part, and you, I noticed on the side of your scriptures, you have the word bride. I think that's beautiful, and be adorned as a bride for that day when thou shalt unveil the heavens and cause the mountains to flow down at thy presence, the valleys to be exalted, the rough places made smooth, that thy glory may fill the earth. And then you have this beautiful promise that when the trump shall sound for the dead, we shall be caught up in the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with the Lord that our garments may be pure, that we may be clothed with the robes of righteousness, with palms in our hands and crowns of glory upon our heads and reap eternal joy for all of our sufferings. E and last night this occurred to me too, eternal joy. What is eternal joy? We reap yeah. eternal joy? That's not, that's not a momentary joy. That's not one that we climb the top of the, we always talk about how we climb the top of the mountain and we have to come down. We're grateful for the view that we saw, but we eventually we have to come down and be a part of the world. No. This is eternal joy. There's no coming down from the mountain at that point. This time we climb that mountain and we receive eternal joy. We receive all that the Father has. We receive all joy, all spirit. With the fullness of the spirit, we receive all that he has. We receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. We see as it says in section 76, we see as he sees. We think as he thinks. We feel as he feels. We are like him because we are full of his spirit. The fullness of the Holy Ghost. The fullness of a member of the Godhead. We are as he is. We see as we are seen. We see others as we are seen. We see others through God's eyes because we are endowed with the fullness of the Holy Ghost. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. And, and of course, the fullness of the Holy Ghost is mentioned there, but for all of our sufferings. And that has just come to me over and over again. We're about to go walk through the cemetery, which I wish you could be with us. But again, the feeling there is... We did this for you. They had a vision. They knew they were led by a prophet. They knew their Savior, Jesus Christ. They knew the restored gospel was true. And they were willing, by the time they got here to Kirtland, they were so poor. And yet they got here and knew they had to follow the Lord's direction and build a temple. So when they gathered in that completed building, and heard these words, I'm sure. Yes, they had palms in their hands, oh. I think, and oh. shouted for joy and felt just like we have done it, which little did they know that this was just the beginning, that they would travel to Salt Lake City. And I heard many years ago, President Hinckley say that these temples, the Kirtland Temple, the Nauvoo Temple, and Salt Lake are all bookends right. to, the, to the story of great sacrifice and great love and testimony of Jesus Christ. These people didn't have to do this. No. I mean, I probably would have said, hey, this is just a little too hard for me. But they did it. And they did it not for themselves, but for us. Elaine, you talked about entering that temple and the palm trees and palm leaves and things. That hallelujah shout that they, that they gave, that hallelujah shout has been written by many. And I apologize that I don't have my references here in front of me. That hallelujah shout, I believe it was Joseph Smith who says that that was a shout that was given in the pre-mortal realm when the, when the Lord gave us his plan of salvation. 
that we shouted the hallelujah shout. And it's also the hallelujah shout in the Kirtland Temple. It's the hallelujah shout in the Nauvoo Temple. It's the hallelujah shout that we have in every dedicated temple throughout the world. And it's also been said that this hallelujah shout, John Taylor, I believe, says this as well, that this hallelujah shout will also be the shout that we shout when we return and are with God again. It's gods and goddesses in the eternal realms. It's powerful. So, so I'm just reading a little, a little message <laughs> yes, from the Sorry, husband. lost my train of thought. I'm going to jump into something else. Okay, please, please that. do, please do. So in, in section 110, we talked about Jesus Christ. And we talked about him coming. And I want to jump over, Elaine, if we can, to verse 11. I think okay. this is powerful. Again, happening in the Kirtland Temple, verse 11. And after this vision closed, the heavens were again opened unto us, and Moses appeared before us. Now, Moses, we look, Elaine was talking about this history. You know, we have this church, we have Adam and Eve, and they start and they continue throughout the earth. Um, we lose those, we lose that authority in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And we gain that authority again when Christ comes to the earth, and at the Mount of Transfiguration, at the Mount of Transfiguration, these keys are restored. And so we have Moses, Elias, Elijah. Elijah coming and restoring these keys at the Mount of Transfiguration. These keys are then lost again, and they are promised to Joseph Smith. It's spoken of in every book of Scripture that we have, that Elijah is going to come in these last days, and he is going to restore these keys. So Moses comes, and then you see in verse 12, so sorry, Moses appeared before us and committed unto us the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. This is critical. These saints have all left their houses, and now Moses has come. It's going to be the gathering that's going to happen throughout the world. Then verse 12. And after this, Elias appears and commits the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and in our seed, all generations after us should be blessed. And after this vision has closed, another great and glorious vision bursts upon us for Elijah, the prophet who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands. And by this ye may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near even at the doors." Last night, it occurred to me as we were discussing this with these wonderful people, we are so incredibly appreciative of these angels that have come. But on this tour, I just and as well on this tour, we have been focusing very heavily on women. We've been focusing on the sacrifice of women. We've been focusing on all the things that women have been doing and their role in relationships and the synergy that is coming between these women. Lucy Mack with Joseph, Emma with Joseph, Eliza R. Snow. We were able to tour the Eliza R. Snow house. That's a whole other story, but it was absolutely incredible with this group of women. But we were also focusing on the women and it, it dawned on me, you look at these women that are mentioned and the relationship between these keys being restored and what we need to rejoice in. The mother of Jesus Christ, Mary, made it possible for Jesus Christ to be on this earth. She is the mother. We look at Eve and the mother of all li living, but then we also look at Moses and we look at his beautiful mother, Jochebed, and that she was willing to sacrifice her son, Moses, and put him in the river. And yeah. then we look at yeah. this next, you know, we look at Abraham, the, the Elias who's restoring the gospel of Abraham. And what about Sarah? And what does she sacrifice? What was yeah. she willing to sacrifice? What was Rebecca willing to sacrifice? And as Moses and as Elder McConkie says, how grateful he was that most that that he went sorry that rebecca went right to the lord and asked the lord to sacrifice asked the lord what she should do yeah and she was able to fulfill then and put in place the entire house of israel because of her righteousness and then we look at elijah and if with elijah i go directly to the widow of zarephath and what was she willing to sacrifice she was willing to sacrifice her son if necessary she, she was willing to sacrifice herself i know her life just Everything. for this prophet yeah. Yeah. can be completely aligned. Yeah. So these yeah. stories of these women that tie into the stories of the men who came and gave these wonderful keys. Without the women, the keys wouldn't be restored. Without the men, the keys wouldn't be restored. It's synergy and it's a unity and it's, it's this unified sacred one it, it, between women and men together. 
It really is. It's so absolutely clear that we can't do anything without the men and the priesthood power they hold. And they can't do anything without us and the priesthood power that we can exercise as well. It's, it's unified. And that's what is restored here is the patriarchal order. And I know, I'll just simply say in our yeah. day and age, there's a lot of negativity towards what we would consider the patriarch and sometimes we confuse patriarchal order with patriarchy. And I want to be very firm and bold in simply saying, because of the patriarchal order of the priesthood, women and men can receive a higher, holier, and happier way of living. Because of the patriarchal order, women and men can be united and receive all of the blessings, all that the Father has. Because of the patriarchal order of the priesthood, women and men can be sealed for eternity and receive the fullness of God's, God's everlasting gospel. Because of the patriarchal it was it was the opposite. I need to make this very clear. Why does Vashti have to leave her throne? Oh, tell, this is Because so... her husband was not willing to live the covenants of the patriarchal order. When women and men break the covenants or are not willing to enter into the patriarchal order of the priesthood, women and men cannot receive the highest happiness, the fullness of joy, the infinite blessings that God has given to us. It is not demeaning and derogatory for women and men to work together. It is a life building. It is a, it is a sacrifice that every woman and man who is a covenant woman and man of God is willing to make and wants to make. It's not demeaning. It's not one person over the other. It's women and men working together to help other people, including themselves, but other people, bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of mankind and have eternal joy. And there is no eternal joy without a husband and a wife and an eternal family combined. That's eternal happiness. That is, that's the promise. It's eternal lives. Yeah. It's eternal lives. It's eternal lives don't exist unless you have a family. You cannot perpetuate family without a husband and a wife. Without, And for all of those who are single, I hope I will say this until I'm blue in the face. I also was single. I get sometimes the heartache. I loved people talking about eternal families because you don't have to be married to be a part of eternal family. You need to be a human to be a part of an eternal family. You need to keep covenants. You need to make and keep covenants with the Lord to be a part of an eternal family. We need men and women together who are humble, who are meek, as it says in section 25, the Doctrine and Covenants, who are willing to live a Christ-like life and be united as a woman and as a man, both using their spiritual gifts and greatest capacities, both united in the priesthood so that they can bring to pass God's work and glory. God, our Father in heaven, our Mother in heaven, want us to be happy. They want us to be happy. They want us to return and they want us to become like them. That is patriarchal order. It's eternal happiness as a husband and a wife, eternal gods. That's why it says, if Elaine, I'm, bla I'm blasting my mouth, but I'm going to do one more thing really quick. That's why you see in section 130, 32. Oh, I always get this confused right here. That's why you see in section 132, verse 20, verse 19 and 20. They, in my law and by my new and everlasting covenant, and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise. By whom is anointed, unto whom I have appointed this power and the keys of this priesthood. In the next resurrection, and shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, powers, dominions, all heights, depths. Then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life that he shall commit no murder, etc. And then it says, and they shall, they meaning the husband and the wife, they shall pass by the angels and the gods, which are set there to their exaltation and glory in all things, as hath been sealed upon their heads, which glory shall be a fullness and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. You cannot have a fullness of seeds forever and ever unless husband and wife are working together arm in arm, locked in, sealed, yoked to Christ himself. Okay. Then, can I do one more? Keep going. Then shall they be gods because they have no end. Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting because they continue. Then shall they be above all, husband and wife, because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods, they be gods, because they have all power and the angels are subject unto them. 
The patriarchal order allows a husband and a wife to become gods and goddesses, to become like Christ because they are yoked to him and he helps them fulfill the measure of their creation and they as a couple help their families fulfill the measure of their creation and it's one eternal round. The patriarchal order is not demeaning. The patriarchal order is not destroying families. The patriarchal order does not put a woman below her husband or above her husband. The patriarchal order makes it possible for families to be eternal. It is from God. It is a covenant. We enter into it together. Adam and Eve entered into it. Thank goodness. We entered into it. Thank goodness. And what a blessing that we have the keys that are restored today that allows us to enter into the patriarchal order. Or as Elder President Benson says, the familial order. Yeah. I love it. Okay. I blasted I my it. mouth, Elaine. I love it. And, and doc, I'm going to just say, we're talking about doctrines, the why, principles, the what, and policies, the how. So the doctrine that Barbara has just taught you is an eternal truth. It is the why. The why is the plan of salvation. It's the infinite atonement of our Savior Jesus Christ. Those are eternal truths that will never change. And why is it, why are we doing this? Why temples? Why the sealing power? Why any of this, Barb? They're all focused on Jesus Christ. And then why does Christ do it? To bring to, to fulfill the, the, the call of his father. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that, that through him the world might be saved. Why does Christ come? To fulfill the will of his Father. What is the will of his Father? It's the will of the Father. It's the will of our heavenly parents to help us become and fulfill the measure of our creation to become like them. That's the why. Okay, and, and, and that's the bottom line. And we are being said, we are, we are being asked to walk. We are going to walk and talk. The Savior loved us so much that he gave everything for us. And it was clear to me and has been more clear than ever on this trip that our pioneer forefathers also loved us so much. We're going to walk here for a minute and just, I, I think we're being told that maybe we can go in somewhere, but I'm not positive. So help me, help me walk without falling. I'm walking looking with at him, you. You're doing a good job. <laughs> I'm walking with him for sure. We're being so careful because we're also losing internet connection. We have the temple on the other side. We have the cemetery. We have the home and we... And we can't we want show to talk you with any you. of it. Yes. <laughs> oh, they say we're. Oh, what do they well, say? we can sit on a bench right here. That's we're going to sit it. on a bench right here. Um, but we're we're about to wind up, I think. Yes. But here's here's my here's my why. Okay. And it it comes right down again to something that Elder Kieran taught us. God is in relentless pursuit of us, and He has provided a way that we can return back to him, proven, pure, and sealed as families in, in, in temples. I am so grateful that I chose the plan of salvation. I'm so grateful we chose the plan of happiness. I'm so grateful we're here on the earth today. I'm so grateful for each one of you and your lives of sacrifice and consecration. You motivate us. You bless us. You bless our families. And I love the idea that Barbara has just, and it's a, tr it's a truth, the, uni the unity. We have to have this unity. We have to be one with the Father. Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. We have to be one with them. We have to be one with the prophet. We have to follow him and do as he asks. And we have to be one as, as husband and wife, as men and women. Together we can accomplish more than we could ever accomplish alone. And I am just grateful that we have this medium that we can transport our testimony and share eternal truths and learn to recognize them and be able to teach these eternal truths in this world. I'm grateful for Instagram. I'm grateful for all of you who are on here. But more than that, I'm so grateful on this trip for a prophet. President Nelson, thank you. Thank you for pushing us to think higher and to be holier. And to, it's making me happier. Yeah, so happy. So, Barb, 
Why don't you finish Thanks, this Elaine. off? Somebody was asking why we aren't walking around. I'll, I'll just say our internet connection will not allow us to walk around. Every time we go on the other side of the visitor center, it stops on us. We would love to walk with you and show you these beautiful sites, but we are going to sit together knowing that we are on these sacred, in these sacred sites. You don't have to be here, but what a blessing it is to be here on these sacred sites. It really is. I, I will just, I will echo what Elaine said about the prophet. I, 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 I may have shared this with all of us before, but I remember when I was taking as a student the class Teachings of the Living Prophets, and I was studying the life of President Nelson, and I had this, you know, we talked r- pillars and rays in, mm-hmm. our, in our discussions and this general conference talk, and I had, I would say, a ray, although it maybe was a pillar, come through the window as I was sitting on the floor on the ground in the colony south of BYU campus, and, and I... I had this impression, the man that you are studying about right now will someday become the prophet of this church. And I knew it was true. It was such a strong and powerful witness that I had never received anything like that. And I followed carefully everything that he taught. And I am so, as Elaine says, I am so grateful that we have a prophet who is pushing, pleading, begging, endowing, turning keys for the women of the church to fulfill the measure of their creation. He has asked us to study priesthood. He's asked us to learn to hear the voice of God. He's asked us to be peacemakers. He is, he is trying to get us to live a happier, holier, and higher way. He's trying to help us become celestial. He's trying to help us become more like Christ. Yes, his message this month on, on unity in the ensign, the Liahona, is absolutely incredible. He's trying to he's trying to lift and build. I believe it's very much what Joseph Smith was doing when he was here. Yeah. President yeah. Nelson sees a higher vision. He sees potential, and he's trying to get us to do it. He's just lifting and begging and pleading, and then he's also giving us the tools to help us be spiritually self reliant. He really is. You know, I just want to make a suggestion. Besides reading and studying 109, I think in preparation for General Conference. We all ought to do the other thing that President uh, Nelson has asked and reread again, just reread section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Because section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants is really the Lord's counsel to all of his beloved daughters. And I think that will prepare us to hear the prophet's words again as we, as we join together in that conference this very weekend. I could not be more grateful. I could not be more grateful to have the priesthood keys restored on the earth today. And, and I'm just grateful to be here with Barbara Morgan Gardner. She is wonderful. She's inspiring. She's the real deal. But even more than that, I'm grateful to share the strong testimony that we, ha- we share of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He lives. He loves us. He's marked the way and shown us the path. And all we need to do is come follow him and walk with him i i am going to finish off elaine and thank you i'm going to finish off with my part here today uh, with section 109 i think these last few verses of section 109 are absolutely powerful so i'm going to start in verse 77 we talked about the infinite fullness of joy in verse 76 in verse 77 O lord god almighty hear us in these our petitions and answer us from heaven thy holy habitation, where thou sittest enthroned. And now listen, these words will be familiar because I just read them because these are going to be similar to what we just saw in section 132. Enthroned with glory, honor, power, majesty, might, dominion, truth, justice, judgment, mercy, and an infinity of fullness from everlasting to everlasting. That's where God sits. That's where God is throned, where it says, sittest enthroned, infinite fullness, everlasting, everlasting, truth, justice, judgment, mercy. And then 78, oh, hear, oh, hear, oh, hear us, oh, Lord, is the plea of the prophet. And answer these petitions and accept the dedication of this temple, of this house unto thee, the work of our hands which we have built unto thy name and also this church to put it into to put it upon sorry to put upon it thy name and help us by the power of thy spirit 
that we may mingle our voices with those bright, shining seraphs around thy throne with acclamations of praise, singing Hosanna to God and the Lamb. And let these thine anointed ones, and I will say, sisters, as we said last night in the temple, I feel so impressed on this. We talk about President Nelson as one of our anointed leaders. But sisters and brothers, anyone who makes and keeps sacred covenants in the temple is anointed. So praise and sing and let these thine anointed ones, you, me, us, our families, let these thine anointed ones be clothed with salvation and thy saints shout aloud for joy. Amen and amen. And amen. So with Elaine and I, I will finish. I'm still going to give Elaine the last word, even though she thinks she just did. But I just will testify that I love the the reality that we are with all of you on Instagram, with all of you who are listening later on YouTube or on other places, that I just simply testify that we are singing and shouting and mingling our voices with you and with these shining seraphs and all of you anointed ones. We have been clothed in, in the robes of the holy priesthood. We have... We have made and are we keeping sacred covenants. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. This is his gospel. This is his power. This is his work. We are simply been given the opportunity to be a part of it. And for that, I shout aloud for joy. Amen and amen. This is his gospel. This is his temple. We do have a prophet of God on the earth today. The keys have been restored. I rejoice. And as it says in section 110, I am so grateful for Jesus Christ himself for not only accepting this temple, but for giving us his life. I love him. I'm grateful that we have an opportunity to be a part of this great work. What a blessing to be in the 11th hour as women and men, together united to bring help bring to pass the immortality, eternal life, and to help repair the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I say that with all of the love I have in the world for Elaine too. I love this woman. I love her mentorship. I love her guidance. I love her spirituality. I love that she'll pray at any moment. I love that she'll teach and mentor and love and love and love and love because she is grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. She gets it. She's grounded. She is God's disciple on the earth. I love her. And I'm grateful that she is helping me come closer to Christ. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so with that, sisters... Our heart's desire would have been to take you all through all of these sacred sites with us. But I hope you can feel through the Spirit. And I hope you can walk with Him and allow Him to teach you. And now we'll just, we'll just say goodbye. It's, been a, it's interesting when we try to do anything at these most sacred sites. There's a lot of opposition, even technologically. But we'll say goodbye. We love you. Thank you for all you are doing. This is an amazing time to be on the earth. And as the Lord said to Emma Smith in section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Behold, thou art an elect lady whom I have chosen. Thank you for being those ladies. And thank you for being faithful and true. We love you. And I, I, I'll testify again because I can't not. Jesus Christ lives and he will walk with you. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We love you, ladies.